So what I want to tell you guys about today is basically a, a very brief overview of my PhD work. <laughs> I'll go a bit into the science because then you see what type of images I was I was making and, and what kind of data I was generating and then what I did with it in the end. So and, and this was all done during my PhD at the University of Zurich. Uh, but then Isabel and Asta and the Eurobiomics uh, archive helped me store my data afterwards. Okay, so basically, uh, as a background, um, this is the human brain, yeah, <laughs> it's an amazing organ, it's made out of millions of neurons that form trillions of connections, and they, these connections allow us to be who we are, right, to see and, and move and feel emotions, etc. But interestingly, during the development of this organ, there's a massive production of cells, but up to 70% of these newborn neurons, they uh, die. And this is a, a seemingly very wasteful process. But it's actually quite critical to establish correct neuronal numbers and proper connections. Uh, and so in response, um, the, our body has evolved uh, a specialized immune cell called microglia in the brain. These are the macrophages of the brain. And these you can see in this image in red. And these cells move around in the brain and collect all the dead cells that we can see here in gray uh, in a process called phagocytosis. Um, and here you can see an example. This uh, is a zebrafish brain, dead cells and microglia all around. And we know how important they are, because if you remove the microglia, this is what happens. You have a brain full of dead cells. Um, so in uh, my old lab, we were studying this process. How do the microglia interact with the dying neurons? Um, and we used for this mainly in a live imaging of the basically the brain of the zebrafish. You just mount them in agarose, put them to sleep, and, and put them under a microscope. So it's all in a, in a native environment. And for this, we use something called a light sheet microscopy or SPIM imaging. And these time, type of data sets, they become massive. Like I think after an imaging session, I was easily, you know, I easily had up to one terabyte of data. Um, and so uh, here you see close up a uh, green microglia and gray, gray, in gray dead neurons. And this is how it would normally phagocytose these dead neurons. You know, it collects one or the other. However, when something goes wrong in the microglia, for example, in this mutant that has problem digesting the neurons, they become massive uh, <laughs> and they can't really phagocytose and they can't really move around. So um, my research question was uh, basically to figure out how do microglia regulate their uptake and what are the underlying mechanisms that facilitate the phagocytic process? Uh, and using basically 90% uh, uh, microscopy techniques. And I did both some um, overview images. So I used confocal to take a lot of stacks of the brains to try to figure out, you know, if there are specific locations that they try to <laughs> stay in or what the distances are, et cetera. So there's a lot of confocal images of large volumes. Uh, but then I also went into uh, looking at tiny details, like how exactly do they capture the neurons and they, they can capture them both, uh, or they can basically both be successful and, and unsuccessful in this process. Uh, I then noticed, you know, just looking at these images, at these individual microglia in the living brain, that even though the microglia have branches in all directions, they actually only collect one by one. So not in all directions. <laughs> Um, and so uh, I also quantified this on so the time between phagocytic events and the distance between the two events and found that there was a, a correlation between that. And these things together, they, they suggest that microglia, they do need to polarize towards the targets, but also that mechanisms are in place that regulate the microglia engulfment. So something is, is regulating how fast they can engulf. And to investigate what these mechanisms were, I decided to generate uh, a lot of genetic markers for intracellular structures inside the microglia. And one of these was, for example, uh, microtubules. So here I had to do very fast imaging, 15 seconds of the, you know, a large part of the brain to find exactly this individual microglia. <laughs> and, and I found that, yes, uh, microtubules are involved. They do form this sort of a cage around the phagosome but they don't seem to be like a critical part of, of when or where the microglia is engulfing. So there was something else. Um, another interesting intracellular object that I, I, I generated or, or made a fluorescent reporter for was the centrosome. So usually the centrosome is located in the center of the cell. 
and it's mainly just there regulating transport of vesicles all over the, the cell. However, in the microglia in the zebrafish brain, the centrosome moves into the phagocytic branches at an incredible speed. It can reach up to um, 14 microns per second, which is um, no, per minute, sorry, which is incredibly fast for such a small cell. And every time there's a phagocytic event, you can just see this organelle moving in and out. And I wouldn't have been able to do this without having done these large scale imaging at very high resolution. Um, and I, I did a lot of quantifications. I found that every time the microglia engulfs with their long branches, the centrosome just goes into the branch, out again, into the next one, out again, et cetera. Um, and so we thought, okay, maybe this is the, the rate limiting mechanism, let's say. So to test this, I overexpressed the marker. You form de novo centrosomes. Basically, you get two centrosomes instead of one. And this way, this cell is basically much more active. When I quantified the engulfment rate, they had double the engulfment rate, meaning most likely the centrosome is limiting how fast the microglia can, can engulf. We even found uh, on occasion now two different phagocytic events happening at the same time, which never happened before. Uh, I also imaged several other markers. I actually saw <laughs> one video from me in Matthew's talk where you see the EBI, no, EB, um, EB3 GFP inside the microglia moving around. Um, so basically, I found that the centrosome is right in the middle of the M talk of, of the microtubules. And also, we found that basically the endosomes, which are vesicles that transport all sorts of things around the cell, um, inside and or in, into and out of the cell, uh, and endosomes are a, in a large part following the centrosome around. So we think you know, what is happening is the centrosome movement, okay, it coincides with the phagocytic events and, and the centrosome is the M talk, but, you know, um, this is important to bring basically endocytic vesicles to the newly formed phagosome to start processing it early and then to bring the microtubules as well to grab the, this big vesicle and drag it into the cell body again. So that's basically kind of the key points from my study. Um, okay, so um, I submitted my work to eLife and during the revision time, I had already gotten a postdoc position and I moved to Iceland, but then I thought, right, <laughs> uh, in total, I generated 15 terabytes of data, you know, uh, the ones that were left after me deleting everything else. Um, and after curation, so maximum projections, et cetera, it still was 640 gigabytes of data. And yes, my groups, they have large servers to work with, however, uh, they couldn't store all this data forever and ever. I mean, and I found it a pity that, you know, my five years of imaging work would just be deleted. So I was really desperate looking for ways to, to do something with my data set. Um, and also like some of this, like the confocal imaging of the, the, the entire brain or the entire object tectum, I thought like, this is a large data set. Like, can't somebody else use this for something? And then finally, eLife requires all data sets to be publicly available. And if this was not my data set, then what, what was my data set? So I thought, you know, I have to find some repository. And by coincidence, I, I met with Joanna Bishop uh, from the Eurobiome team uh, at the conference in Iceland. And she told me about the Biomets archive. And I think, you know, I'm, I'm one of the <laughs> um, test projects for them <laughs> for uploading all of this. Um, so this was the paper. Uh, but basically, uh, what did they offer me was basically, uh, they filled this missing gap in the field. There were some archives where you can just dump whatever on it, but it's very unorganized and people, it's not easy to navigate through those. Um, it's a safe place to store my, my data set uh, forever and ever. <laughs> basically, you know, they can now delete this from the servers uh, in my old group. Um, I can also now share the data with my with the world easily. Other people can reuse my data if they want. And also it's a repository of all sorts of data sets, which I found actually quite interesting to, to flip through. So that was cool. And so what did I have to do as a user? So I first, of course, had to collect all the data sets that I used in my study and were published. And this was, as I said, 640 gigabytes or something or 700. It was a large data set. Um, then I had to think, and this is what they were just talking about before the break, I had to group them into different study components. So I decided 
to group this by, you know, the imaging method. So I was using three types of images, confocal, spin, and, and spinning disk. And then I had some drug experiments as well to test the pathways. And so I grouped the, my data set by these study components because that was easiest to kind of get the rest um, in, a, in a similar kind of group. I then had to annotate everything. <laughs> that was a lot of work. Uh, I hope they will you know, uh, develop something that automatically collects the metadata from the images. That would be super helpful in the future, but I had to do that manually. I mean, many images had the same kind of uh, resolution, etc. but you know, um, this was a lot of work. So I would say for anyone out there who is about to do this, you know, start early, start it as soon as you submit, because this is going to take a while. Uh, but the more data, the better, because then the user can actually really understand what, what the data set is about. Um, and then I had to upload the data with annotations. I was surprised that this only took two days. This was super fast. So I was very impressed by that. And then they, they basically hold the release. They don't release the data until I actually told them like, okay, my paper is being released. Now you can make it publicly available. And they were also super fast doing that. So I was very happy with that. So Isabel is of course the hero of all of this process in my case. <laughs> thank you very much for that. I have to thank my, my group members and the, and the microscopy facility in, in Zurich, which were super great. And then Isabel, Johanna for introducing me to the Biomets Archive and Ashta for also helping out with all of this. And, and this is my data set here, Biad 564, if anyone's interested. 